right? And so suffering really becomes a reality as a result of the introduction of sin and death into the human experience. Christ comes and he redeems us. Right. I thought we were restored whole again. Why still the pain? Why the suffering? When he says, take up your cross and follow me, we'll follow you where? Hmm. You know, I, I often ask, like, where am I following you to? But ultimately, I'm following him into glory. The Holy Spirit is is um, the seal, the you know the stamp, and the image in that seal is Christ. The image that's in that seal is the image of Christ, and He makes holy ones with the image of the Holy One when He stamps on us. Right. The most important thing that should inspire us from the life of Saint Pope Gregorius or any saint is to love God generously. Christ comes and he redeems us. Right. I thought we were restored whole again. Why still the pain? Why the suffering? What's yeah. the, the point of that after being restored, redeemed? Yeah. I mean, you could say the same thing about uh, death, right? If Christ overcame death, well, we still experience physical death, mm -hmm. right? So there, there's still a sort of remnant of, of our sort of the, the Adamic sin. You know, there's still... Mm -hmm. The, the consequences of certain aspects of the fall that continue, right? And there's a reason for that. I think, for example, when we, we look at sin itself, uh, St. John, in his epistle, I think in the fourth chapter, he speaks about, you know, the one who is born of God, who has the seed of God in him, cannot sin, right? But the third chapter, the chapter just before that, he says that if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, who has become the propitiation. It's that word that most readers mm -hmm. can't say, right? Was it not propitiation this whole time? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> the sacrifice, right? So which one is it? Can we not sin? or we? So mm -hmm. what he's talking about is that we have, as a result of our participation in Christ's redemption, right? Through baptism, dying and rising with him in baptism, we have the new man, Right. But this new man will be realized in, in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, we will not be able to sin. We will not be tempted. We will not be able to sin. We have that experience of the new man within us. But we also have sort of the leftover the, or the remnant of the original sin, the ancestral sin, right? And the reason why both have to remain is because our freedom has to still participate in choosing, saying yes to God, right? If God were sort of by baptism or to remove the possibility of sin, right, then, then we wouldn't be free. So this is still the time of choosing, right? It's still the time of saying yes to God and choosing to, to follow his commandments, be his disciples, you know, struggle uh, against the flesh and the desires of the flesh. So the same thing, I think, with suffering, right? That suffering, Christ didn't come to remove suffering, but he came to enter into suffering and to transform suffering and to make a way through suffering that could be redemptive, salvific, and, and, and ultimately part of the witness of uh, the evangelical witness of our Christian faith. When you see somebody who suffers and loves God in that suffering and is grateful to God in that suffering, that's a more powerful witness than just preaching the, the word, mm -hmm. you know? So so suffering, and we can speak about like the, the, the reasons why suffering has a sort of important part in the Christian experience. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if we want to go there now or- No, I, I, I just wanted to interrupt you because you said Christ entered into the suffering. There's something that I, I heard you, Father, actually in, in one of your sermons, you're talking about Christ kind of like the inverted pyramid. And I found that fascinating. Yeah. So if you can just, you know, recap it, I have a few questions about sure. him, you know, kind of going to the bottom so of that pyramid. The model of the inverted pyramid is not my model. It's a model that um, was given by a contemporary Eastern Orthodox uh, elder who was recently canonized, Elder Sophroni of Essex, England, and uh, related through the teachings and the writings of his disciple who is currently uh, a spiritual father and writer on the ascetical life uh, and also in Essex, England at the monastery there, uh, whose name is Father Zechariah Zacharu. And 
the explanation that Father Zacharias gives of his elders' teaching is that he says the world is like a pyramid where the powerful, the rich, the uh, those who exploit the others sit at the top of the pyramid and they sit on top of the shoulders of the weaker, you know, members of, of the world, of the society. And so inherent in that structure, of course, is total injustice. And he says that Christ came and he took that pyramid and he inverted it and he became the head of the inverted pyramid. So he put himself at the bottom of the inverted pyramid. And that means that he went downward, right, to the to the depths, to the pits of mm -hmm. not only in his condescens condescension in his uh, incarnation, but even entering into the to the depths of Hades. Right. And he carries through his salvific works, his love, his redemption, he carries the weight of the whole world on, as the head of the inverted pyramid. And, and the beauty of that model is that Christ invites all of us to make that downward journey to be with him at the head of the inverted pyramid, right? And so what that means is that there is only one way for the Christian life, right? Which is that downward, that kenosis, that self-emptying. Uh, and that Christ wants us to participate in the proclamation and the effect of his redemption. What do I mean by that? When we pray for each other, we believe that our prayers have uh, value before God, right? So in a sense, too, our participation in the sufferings of Christ also proclaim his death and his resurrection and bring about the effects of, of his redemption. And, and this is what St. Paul talked about in his epistle to the Colossians when he said, I make up in my own body right, what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. Sort of an outrageous comment that he makes. What can be possibly lacking in the afflictions of Christ? But he says he does that as a member of the church, on behalf of the church. right? So that Christ as the head, he entered into suffering. He entered into the experience of suffering. He became the head of the inverted pyramid. And all of us that choose to be his disciples, to follow in his path by carrying our cross and following him, we also participate in some way in that process of bearing the burdens of the world. And that means we suffer. If and I may, Father, though, that there's two kinds of sufferings in there, two kinds of sufferings, forgive me, in there where one is chosen suffering, you know, I, I choose right. to go with Christ, and then the one that's kind of forced upon sure. me. So let's stick with the first one because it kind of seems that that's kind of sure. what you're implying that I, I take up my cross and not the so one. So let's use the words voluntary and involuntary. Fantastic. So the voluntary suffering. Yeah. See, I told you, masters and not so much. So... Uh, the voluntary don't laugh at me uh the, the voluntary no, it's better than force that's it <laughs> the, the voluntary suffering you're in north america here that's a that's a dangerous word to almost say you know like the voluntary it's almost like are you socialist are you communist are you you know giving like it's what i earned and and who i am and because you're saying like it's that you know the rich are on top of the poor and but that's not what you're you're meaning. You're not meaning that, you know, I have to feel a guilt over no. being successful or a guilt. You're saying that I'm voluntary kind of. Well, first bearing. of all, let's let's uh, so so we're we don't sort of like go too far off. Like, what do we mean by voluntary suffering? We certainly don't mean that as Christians, we. Although some saints may have in their own unique calling or circumstance uh, chosen uh, or sought suffering, but for the majority of us Christians, we are not to seek suffering. Mm -hmm. We're not to ask for suffering because that could be presumptuous. We could be sort of like the in the ear of the martyrs. There were some who, out of presumption, not out of out, out of a real sense of vocation or calling from oh, God, no. they went to the governors and and then they they renounced Christ. They couldn't carry through with the with the mm -hmm. sacrifice. Right. So so we have to be careful that we're not when we say voluntary for us, voluntary suffering is basically 
you know, uh, the way of the cross. It's it's carrying the cross, the daily dying, dying to ourselves, the the what we call sometimes call the ascetical life. So you're right? not referring to charity. You're not referring to hard work for someone else. Well, not... certainly, certainly it includes. Um, so it includes the ascetical practices, like obviously, like uh, denying ourselves, self control, right, fasting, you know, uh, prostrations and prayers, vigils, these things where we discipline the body. But it also includes sort of the, uh, the the decisions to to have long suffering love with those who oppose us, to uh, accept persecution, to love our enemies, uh, to be patient and tolerant with mm -hmm. those who annoy us and disturb us. Right? That's a real martyrdom, a daily martyrdom. That's a real suffering. When I'm at work and I'm being persecuted, or I'm at church and I'm being persecuted, or you know, and and I suffer silently for the sake of Christ, the meek lamb who who opened not his mouth, right? That's Rejoicing, suffering. being seemingly glad, yeah. For great is your, your word. Yeah. So that that is a but that's a volunt that's a voluntary suffering of carrying the cross with Christ. He asked. That's that's the gospel. That's the commandments, right? That's different than the involuntary suffering that you call like suffering that's Sickness, forced upon us, yeah. you know, or that's we didn't choose, right? And so, but. But when it comes to like all of those things, we don't run after those things. We don't choose those things. We, what's more important, I think, to think of this in terms of the spiritual life is doing the will of God, right? What's most important is the will of God. It's mm -hmm. not my will. If, if my will is to suffer and it's not God's will for me, then that's, again, that's, that's, that's not, uh, you know, spiritually healthy. That's presumption, right? So it's more of, Aligning my will with the will of God, right? There is one, one of the saints who said, I would rather be a vile worm by the will of God than one of the seraphim by my own will, right? So it's about what is God's will? And if his will is for me to endure some hardships, some suffering, some distress, then I do it because I want to align my will with his will. I love his will. But if I, again, if I choose it on my own will and it's not what's good for me, or the right time, or I'm not mature spiritually enough to handle that kind of suffering, then ultimately it's gonna hurt, it's gonna hurt me. It's gonna harm me. So then, let's, while we're still on the voluntary side, forget to uh, masters in theology, uh, priests, and uh, come You're to. Gonna keep mentioning yeah, this yeah, every yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and focus on layman Paul right over here. Where do I start to descend that pyramid? Yes. What? What? Like, give me my. You know, I go to work. I come back home. I. I'm late at, you know, go with the kids to their soccer practices, basketball. Like, where am I? How do I do that? Where do I find my place in that pyramid? I think very simply, it's it's following the gospel, like 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 uh, living the gospel, right? If you if you live the gospel, if you read the Sermon on the Mount and you do the things that our Lord commands us to do in the Sermon on the Mount, again, you begin to live that voluntary life of self-denial of sacrifice of carrying the cross of suffering right of suffering in the way again in, in the small ways that come to us every day right so following the commandments obeying the commandments struggling to keep the commandments um, obeying the church you know sometimes people ask uh or they'll say you know i fasted but i didn't really feel a benefit so i maybe i shouldn't fast and 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 the question i often ask is what kind of benefit did you expect? Hmm. Were you expecting that after you fasted and you did everything, you ticked off? All, Walk you know, on water. Off? Uh, yeah, that you're going to start like <laughs> levitating when you no, pray. Healing or... people with my sight, you know. Like I just... said, but but maybe all you gained from fasting was <laughs> obeying the church mm -hmm. and denying yourself. But there's nothing more. I, I'm, just, I'm just I'm just I'm just yeah. saying that that in and of itself, yeah. the, the the practice of denying yourself mm -hmm. out of obedience is beneficial, right? So. My point is, is that by obeying the gospel, the evangelical mm -hmm. counsels of the gospel, by struggling to keep the commandments, by following the path that the church gives us, that is enough to put us on the path of, of what's the voluntary part f from us, right? And that'll prepare us, because I think this is what you were getting at, is, is that will prepare me then for the involuntary suffering, mm -hmm. right? You know, you, we, we had planned to talk a little bit about a contemporary mm -hmm. person that I knew, Tan Samira, you know, and she suffered a lot in her life um, in, in different ways, 
from within her family, uh, financially, from uh, many, many illnesses, right? And what prepared her to endure that suffering and to rejoice in it, right? Like St. Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings, right? Um, was that she had already lived a life from, from a very young age. She was living a life of involuntary suffering, of involuntary, you know, uh, or sorry, voluntary uh, mm -hmm. sacrifice, voluntary suffering through the way of the gospel and the church, you know, not in some extraordinary way, but that prepared her for the more extraordinary sacrifices that God asked of her, you know, so, so that when that difficulty comes, whether it's an illness or a real hardship within our families, if we've already been living as disciples of Christ, carrying our cross, we will be better prepared to see the will of God and, and the, um, sort of what's waiting on the other side of that, right? There was, a, sorry, I'll just read very briefly. There was a, a beautiful, I just remembered this, uh, uh, one of the monastic saints, a nun, she had a vision. And uh, she saw three groups of people. There were one group, they were crucified on, on crosses next to Christ. And there was another group, they were holding their cross uh, firmly in their hands. And then there was a third group that were dragging their crosses sort of behind them reluctantly. And then the voice of Christ came to her and said, those who resemble me most in my sufferings and in, 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 in my cross will, will resemble me most in my glory. Mm. Right? And so we could see sort of like this uh, progression, right? There are those who sort of reluctantly drag their crosses there are those who carry their crosses but don't embrace their crosses. And there are those who fully embrace their cross. Right now, we have to start at some point in our life. Mm -hmm. And the church and the gospels give us the the tools, I think, Father, right? I agree. <laughs>